we have the, the challenge of the volume and the, um, the range. So how do you solve that? Then we are looking into the air taxis, everything that has been done so far the last decade, uh, vertical takeoff and landing. Uh, most of them are actually uh, focused on battery uh, electric. So we had to find something that is, again, realistic and feasible for us. And, and, um, we have a quick market entrance. So it was, uh, inevitable that we had to go hybrid. So, which means we're using with one leg, we're still in the existing technology. We were using the tour props. And with the other leg, basically, we're in the hydrogen technology, which also uh, prepares us to actually in the future eventually go fully hydrogen. Welcome to Sustainability in the Air, the world's first podcast dedicated to sustainable aviation. I'm your host, Shashank Nigam, the CEO of Simply Flying. Every Thursday, I have important conversations with top aviation executives, technology entrepreneurs, and policymakers helping aviation take climate action. Conversations that help separate the signal from the noise. Whether you are a frequent flyer or an airline executive, if you care about sustainability or simply love traveling, welcome aboard. Before we begin this week's episode, a special shout out to our exclusive sponsors for September, S2Air. S2Air is an aviation and climate data platform that helps airlines make more informed choices, especially about their non-CO2 impact. It's one of the few things airlines can do today to reduce their climate impact. So go check it out, S2Air, E-S-T-U-A-I-R-E. My guest today is Freshta Farzam. Freshta is the CEO and founder at Light Aviation, which is building a 40-seater eVTOL for regional aviation. This is a bit different from the typical vertical takeoff and landing urban air mobility vehicle. This is about regional mobility. They are partnering with HT Dynamics for hydrogen propulsion for their Skybus eVTOL aircraft. Freshta and I have met a couple of times. She is very inspiring and I hope you enjoy this chat on how Freshta is looking to rethink regional aviation. Freshta, welcome to the podcast. What inspired you to start Light Aviation and develop a 40-seat EVTOL aircraft when most other companies are um, you know, focused on much smaller 2-5 to five seat uh, EVTOLs and air taxis? Hi, Shashang. Yeah, thank you for having me on your podcast. Um, I That is a really good question, actually. I started actually with the market research uh, four or five years ago, and uh, I understood that uh, everyone was looking into one direction. Like, and then you suddenly had hundreds and two hundreds of uh, EVTOLs and air taxis. And I love the idea, but uh, somehow it came to my mind that the first question was like, I guess, as a disruptive mind that I have, like, why is there nothing bigger? Um, and then I, I questioned the 20 seats. And then I was like, no, 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 20 seats is not enough if you actually um, want to um, uh, get bigger and actually there is a market for it like looking at our normal regional aircrafts that we have um, or uh, so the, the volume of the 40 passengers is something that that uh, actually is required but a lot of um, uh, companies are not looking into it because of course uh, we understood that um, there's other focuses on it and other ecosystems and that's when uh, we actually focused on um, the 40-seater, and then I saw the Rotodyne, and that actually gave me a lot more confidence um, that I'm on the right track because when I saw the, the Rotodyne, it was uh, this uh, really nice documentary, the 40-seater um, on the rooftop in London, and four, 40 passengers actually entering that aircraft. This was mind-blowing to me. Of course, the rotor and everything was too loud and all the issues that they have, but had... But uh, that they were even like laying the maps for London 70 years ago. I was like, okay, this is something that I definitely want to um, uh, pursue and, and actually be the one that uh, disrupts the market with a 40 series we tell now. <laughs> wow. You, are you telling me you watched the documentary and you were inspired to start an aviation company? 
Yes, exactly. <laughs> that gave wow. me a big boost of the confidence. Yes, that's um, <laughs> that is amazing. That's like watching, uh, you know, that's like watching a documentary on Apollo Eleven and and then aiming to become an astronaut. Yeah, yeah I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very curious, Presta. What is your background and what led you to this path down this down this road and gave you the courage to start? a sustainable aviation startup um good question i think i'm i'm a, i've been always a multitasker my all my whole life so i uh was working with different um uh, in different industries renewable energy and also the upstream market but uh, aviation i guess even after high school i had the dream of becoming a pilot um a commercial pilot they invited me for the interviews but i actually uh rejected because i didn't have the courage I didn't even go there. So I guess that dream was somewhere in my subconscious mind, like uh, programmed, and I had forgotten about it. So now, um, four or five years ago, I had a sort of like a stroke of fate. And then suddenly I realized like, okay, this is, um, I, I want something else. I want something new. And that's when I opened up my horizon, my mind, and I researched and the air taxis really caught my attention. I was like, okay, this is something that really, and aviation, I just, so I'm not an engineer. I, I just really, I guess I understood or I understand probably like as a non-expert how to ask the right questions. So that's what I did in aviation now. And it's, um, it's beautiful to see how it's being embraced as well and how we're supported as well on this journey. Well, a lot of the, uh, this is so fascinating that a lot of the founders I've had, um, have had technology experiences or they're scientists. What in your past experience do you makes you feel that you are well suited for this role? Probably from my past life, I know that. I <laughs> <laughs> okay, now this is getting a bit woo woo for this podcast, but carry on. <laughs> yeah. No, but um, I, I, um, I think it's just because I have really great um, engineers around me, so um, understanding the puzzle pieces and actually knowing how to put the puzzle pieces, and I guess that's the skill or the talent that I bring uh, that we can talk about anything and I just need to be explained what are the puzzle pieces and then uh, how about we just then turn around and see how we can actually solve uh, or find a solution for it. So I, I was very, I'm very grateful that I was actually accompanied by, by really um, genius engineers uh, that could um, introduce me to um, actually understand aviation and also the aircraft design and everything that we needed to know from a deeper uh, perspective, like to, uh, so, that's what um, it's, it's. I guess a teamwork as well that that gave me the confidence that okay, we're on the right track. And then increasing the team a bit, and then understanding okay, they're all actually seeing it that it's possible, that's feasible. So that's what um, step by step we we got there. Yeah, <laughs> I relate to it because I myself came from a technology back background, but I used to love planes a lot, and hence. 16, 17 years ago, I decided to take the plunge, left my job and started simply flying and just wanted to be surrounded by planes and work with airlines. And here we are, 17 years on, no longer a startup. So I can totally relate and I do wish you all the best for your journey. And this is not the last question of the podcast. <laughs> I, I want to go back into, into the aircraft that you're building. Now, can you explain the tandem tilt wing design of the sky bus and, and the sky truck what is a tandem tilt wheel design and why did you choose this configuration over other eb tolls right um the tandem tilt wing yes uh, i guess uh, that's where we wanted to have like some a solution that is very realistic but also feasible and and i guess with the German mindset that I have, it has to be also very safe. So, uh, and, um, practical in that sense. And, and, and that's why we were looking at also, of course, tilt rotors, but the challenge is that the heavy weight that we have and also the range of thousand kilometers plus the 40. So we scale it up in, in volume. So 40 passengers plus the range of up to thousand kilometers. That's what, when we require something that is more solid. So if we went with, with tilt rotors, for our design, it wouldn't be a good match um, uh, because we're intending to um, fly uh, to cruise over a thousand kilometers. For that, we need the wings, and so it was inevitable to to choose wings. And then, of course, we want to have a vertical takeoff, and that's when we actually looked at 
the quite the easiest solution out there that have been proven so far like uh, in military they have used the the uh, tilt wing as well and uh, like the Hiller X18 then we have uh, today Dufour Aerospace for example I'm happy when people are actually using the tilt wing because that is exact, exactly what we're also believing in and, and standing behind. And uh, now recently, Sikorsky also announced, I think, with a Tundra, a Tiltwing uh, eVTOL, uh, which I'm happy about. So this is something where we're also like there, uh, very um, uh, very happy to that we have chosen the Tiltwing. Uh, and yes, the, the two, the tandem, uh, because we have a lot of weight uh, in the aircraft with the 40 passengers. Uh, so it's like around 17 tons, and it's inevitable to... Um, use two of those beautiful wings. <laughs> What's the difference between the sky bus and the sky truck? Uh, the sky bus uh, is, uh, ha- has the seats, so the 40 seats uh, for the 40 passengers. And uh, then you take out the seats and you have the cargo version. So it's the sky truck. And so uh, that one actually can uh, carry four and a half, uh, up to four and a half tons of cargo. So that makes us like the largest drone currently worldwide. That's very, very fascinating. Um, now, you will use the hybrid propulsion system, combining turbine engines with electric motors that are powered by hydrogen fuel cell. For those who may be listening to this podcast for the first time, can you please demystify what this means? <laughs> sure, Shashak. Well, um, we again, we have the, the challenge of the volume and the um, the range. So... How do you solve that? Then we are looking into the air taxis, everything that has been done so far the last decade, uh, vertical takeoff and landing. Uh, most of them are actually uh, focused on battery uh, electric. So we had to find something that is, again, realistic and feasible for us. And, and um, we have a quick market entrance. So it was uh, inevitable that we had to go hybrid. So which means we're using with one leg, we're still in the existing technology. We were using the tour props. And with the other leg, basically, we're in the hydrogen technology, which also uh, prepares us to actually in the future eventually go fully hydrogen. So that's what we um, and uh, have chosen basically consciously to, to uh, get into that market. Yeah. But it would have been uh, unrealistic if we just chose basically uh, only hydrogen for that mass uh, or only batteries. Um, whoever is basically claiming that today that 40 passengers take it vertically with batteries um, is impossible, unfortunately, with the technologies that we have today. Yes, tomorrow right. probably, uh, but not today. Very, very interesting. Now, let's make this a bit more practical. Where can we fly? It seems like in a lot of your feasibility studies, you're not looking to replace airline routes, but instead ferry routes and bus routes and things like that. That's very interesting. And I remember uh, one of the studies you have done is to replace ferry routes in the Seattle area. I have myself lived in the Pacific Northwest, and that's from, you know, I think one of your routes is from Bainbridge Island to downtown Seattle and to Redmond. Why target that market and what's the use case here? Beautiful. Yeah, this uh, was uh, actually, we started the conversations last year after our announcement. Um, and uh, the AM Institute actually reached out to us and uh, uh, speaking to them, actually looking for different news and business cases that would be practical for the US market. They actually suggested um, the, the Seattle route uh, because that is over the waterways that we were looking at. And um, so we looked at that route and uh, we saw, okay, the pain point is, let's say, the, the Microsoft, one of the largest employers um, in that area with 53,000 employees. That we have the ferries on this side um, going from Bainbridge Island. They have to take the ferry to go to Seattle and they pay $29 per, uh, per ticket per, for the ferry. Then they also have their cars on the ferry and then they continue their journeys <laughs> with the car by car. So we were calculating that th- th- those routes. I've done this journey, by the way. I've really? done this journey. Oh, house. there you go. <laughs> Seven days in a row because Simply Flying Team had a retreat on Bainbridge Island. No. And we did this journey every day from the island, car, everyone gets on the car, everyone takes the ferry on the car, we continue driving. It was like four hours, two hours based yeah. on traffic. Oh, thank you for saying that. Yeah, yeah that, that's exactly it. And that's why, um, because I had my person, yeah, but when I heard that, I was like, okay, this, there, there must be something that we can now do to actually 
um, uh, get a, a dive in deeper into this. So, so we chose the, the exactly this route, and then we saw that it. Yeah, well, uh, an average, they would take like, let's say, one and a half hour to even get to Redmond um, by car and by ferry. And uh, so that's when my question was like, okay, but if we take the Sky Bus, you have a Vertiport in uh, Bainbridge Island, and then you have another one at the campus of Microsoft, you're there in 15 minutes. So uh, that's when we actually did the white paper together with them as well with the AM Institute and um, to get into that use case. And that's just one of the routes. So um, it was very intriguing also for the state of Washington. They have also approached us. So there's some, uh, th these kind of uh, routes um, are not the only ones. So similar to that, anything that basically is waterways. Um, so anywhere we, we, where we can uh, extend uh, or replace some ferry routes uh, with our sky bus, that's um, definitely uh, also in the Asia Pacific region, um, the, the, the interest is there. And the conversations are ongoing. And also the uh, buses and trains, yes, because we see it as a cluster. Like we, if you look at it, it's like a this tube that can carry like, let's say, a wagon, a train wagon or a bus or a regional aircraft, like anything that basically can, can carry 40 passengers. That's what we can actually replace <clears throat> on a point-to-point -point, um, uh, delivery. So that's why uh, we're looking at it. And um we're, we're looking at routes, for example, and in, in Europe, we have all these um, uh, cities that are actually in a quite like uh, short distance uh, away from each other. So let's say Hamburg, Amsterdam or uh, Paris, uh, Amsterdam. So you have these routes and it uh, we can cover all these routes with our sky bus because we have a range of up to a thousand kilometer. And this is where we are actually disrupting um, the, the way of commute in the future. So... <laughs> Please, I'm sorry. No, I can't go on and on. Is, I'm sorry. No, but this is this is so interesting because this brings me back about 20 years when airlines like Volaris were starting in Mexico, where they said, "Oh, in Mexico, most people take buses." Or even in Brazil, a lot of people were taking long buses. You know, sometimes 18 hours, 20 hours from Tijuana to Toluca, for example. And they said, "Well, let's start a route from Toluca to, to Tijuana," and they actually went to bus stations gave people free tickets to say, why don't you try flying instead? And their target was not other airlines, but also, but instead bus passengers. Who would be your customers, Freshta, for this aircraft? Will you actually sell this to the ferry companies in Washington State in, uh, and in British Columbia and in Europe? Who's going to buy this? Good question, Shashank. Um, and that's exactly, I think, the fun part of my journey here that we are uh we are disrupting even that um so what uh because the conversations that i have sometimes like yeah so who do you need i'm like i need the ferry operators because i want them to understand we're not taking business away from them we actually need operators that still cover those routes for us we're not an operator we're just a manufacturer so our customers are yes existing uh regional airlines they, they're covering certain routes, so they, they can use our sky bus. But also, if we're creating new routes, uh, they can assist us. But if, if it's the ferries actually having certain um, areas that they cover, yes, even an, a ferry operator can become an air operator for that route um, to take over basically our uh, sky bus to, to have a shuttle. Let's say, for example, Bahamas. Um, if we actually create like 98% of their islands is not inhibited. So if we offer the, um, they're, they're having their ferries, et cetera, but it's, um, uh, the, the, with, with the sky bus, we would actually, um, have like a shuttle, like 15 to 17 times per day flying back and forth. That needs an air operator. So, um, th these are our customers that, that they are, because the operating costs are much lower and it's, it's more beneficial because at the end, people can actually commute to work at Nassau, come back to the other islands. And what you do, you're actually, you're inhibiting those islands and you're creating economy. So this is the bigger strategic step where indirectly we have their, uh, our customers as well. But, um, yeah, so yes, it's, it could be also the bus operators. We're also in talks with, with bus operators, um, and uh, to expand also their horizon to say, okay, you can actually be a operator, <laughs> air operator. Okay. So for, for context, again, this brings me back about 10 years ago, not 20 when Bularis was starting, uh, where I believe 
Airbus was trying to market the A380 not to airline operators but to the Indian railways. Ah, yeah. Because each train, those those luxury fast trains in India at that time carried about 800 passengers, and an A380 in, in higher density can carry 800 passengers. I don't think there are any Indian railways operated Airbus A380s today. So we all know how that campaign ended. But have you had conversations already with ferry operators and bus operators? How have they been going? Or do you foresee someone like Microsoft coming and saying, oh, all my employees in Redmond should use this and your customer is going to be Microsoft. How, how's the response been? Yeah. No, uh, the, the response, good question. The response is, um, you know, I, I think that that's why uh, doing the hybrid, I think the hybrid is, is like safe for everyone in all, uh, many sec- sections. So, so even here when it comes to the business cases and also the customers, no, of course, the fear of the unknown is too big for some of them. Uh, the, the, there are some hurdles, like how is that going to happen? But yes, the more we are actually like now laying the infrastructure and getting our customers, getting our pre-orders and going there step by step, that's when actually, just like with the air taxis, the market actually sees, even the customers then see that, okay, wait, if we now at this point don't actually jump in, we're going to actually lose our routes. So how about we do collaborate? So, and that's what we're actually doing uh, now. Also the conversations. Yes, maybe for some ferry operators, it's impossible to become an air operator. Yes, I get it. But there is another airline operator that I can actually partner up and, and take it over and actually create a business model where everyone ha- has a win-win situation here. So that's what we're approaching. I mean, that, that's the way we're approaching it. But yes, it is a journey of probably uh, five yeah. or ten years <laughs> that until everyone is actually like uh, um, on board. I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> yep. What about infrastructure requirements or challenges for a high capacity EV toll like yours? And we are talking ten times the typical EV toll proposal out there, which is about four passengers. Yours has forty passengers. Um, you know, what do you need in terms of landing pads, vertiports, charging, refueling? What's the deal there? Yeah, uh, and, and uh, good question. That that's what we're actually very actively pursuing as well, because our customers can only purchase our aircraft if they know that the infrastructure is also there. So the ecosystem needs to be there, and we are. Um, that's why, like, closely collaborating with the airports, uh, with some of the European airports in the US, uh, we're collaborating with them. Uh, then we are uh, also with Vertiports collaborating. So those are our infrastructure partners. Why at this stage? Because we're an OEM manufacturer. But yes, this is, again, the fun part of our journey that we can actually now um, come in and say, okay, this is our Skybus and we need you're right. We need for, for our Skybus a bit larger, um, landing pads. But even though, uh, we take like 10 times more, uh, the passenger amount that, that, uh, that, uh, the air taxis can, can take, we still have the, the let's say like, uh, some of them have a wingspan of 11, 13 meters or 14 meters total. And our wingspan is only 19 meters and the length is only 20 meters. So that means, Approximately, we need a landing pad of around 40 meter by 40 meter, and it needs to be uh, solid enough to carry the 17 ton gross weight that we have. So those are like roughly the, the basic uh, requirements that we have, uh, which means also that the regional airports or the, the vertiports that are already like designing, um, establishing the infrastructure for air taxis, they just have to minimally like adjust it for our sky bus. So that's one good thing. The other thing is the refueling part of it. And that's where actually the, the, the difference is, of course, to the air taxis where we don't really need the electric charging in that sense, but we need the hydrogen and we need SAF. So that's why in those collaborations as well, we're like uh, diving in deeper into how to best refuel it? Uh, what's the best solution here? Because uh, our sky buses are coming. Hydrogen refueling is inevitable. We need it anyway. So uh, that's when our expertise and their expertise, we're, we're diving into deeper to, to, to find the proper solution for electric charging, SAF, and uh, hydrogen. But also because, again, we're hybrid, also for kerosene. So how do we combine all of that? Because we, um, uh, we need three of them, basically. So... Um, 
What's the response you get from airports when you go approach them to speak about this? Or are you talking to generally city councils? No, I'm uh, speaking uh, directly with the airports. So most of them actually have uh, quite some uh, um, interesting programs uh, uh, regarding sustainability or hydrogen, especially in Germany and and um, and in the uh, Netherlands and uh, France as well. So we're we're looking like for. Uh, the, the same mindset, at least when it comes to hydrogen topic and also like when it comes to, um, EV tolls and air taxis. So that's when we know that we're speaking the same language and they know it's inevitable. And then we basically approach, uh, yeah. So we, we speak to them directly. Got it. Got it. It's going to be so fascinating. I mean, you're, <laughs> I wouldn't say you're disrupting the industry, but you're, you're questioning so many of the traditional assumptions. It's going to be very fascinating to see how this comes out. Uh, and pans out. Now, one of the interesting partnerships you have had is with Chrysalian, which is a five-seater air taxi for last mile delivery, and Inmarsat for connectivity and InFlight Canada for cargo. These are very, very different and fascinating partnerships. What do you believe these will entail and why are you partnering with these uh, companies? Hey, you picked you picked the right ones out. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, no, they're, they're good. I mean, uh, they're they're very interesting because um, they they do um, stand up because um, of course they wouldn't be like. Um, uh, but yeah, I tell you why. For example, Chrysalian is one of um, yes, it's an EV toll. It's an OEM manufacturer. So we know what we can do a five seater or four seater air taxi cannot do, which is the volume of, of passengers and also the range. And that's where we come in. So uh, we're actually creating new business uh, and new routes uh, on the regional um, routes, so, which means we have the 40 passengers that fly in and our 40 passengers, they will need for the last mile someone to take care of it. So that's when we will need, so it's collaboration, we will need the the air taxis. The air taxis will need maybe also us to actually cover some regional routes um, because with the batteries, of course, they can only get to the up, up to 100 kilometers or 200 kilometers and we can cover the long ranges and actually that's where we get hand in hand and uh, with the drones is the same. So sky truck is for the cargo and then, uh, for the last mile is also, um, the partnerships with the drones in, in conversation. But I'd love to hear about how Inmarsat is helping on the connectivity piece as well. Uh, yeah, Inmarsat is um, supporting us with the SATCOM uh, topics uh, for our aircraft. And uh, they're interesting for us because uh, as we will probably proceed, um, as we will probably like step into the Skytruck uh, first with the cargo deliveries and then uh, also in remote areas, that's where we see Inmarsat is very valuable as our partner. And Inflight Canada is um, interesting for us because from scratch, we need those partners uh, as we're aiming to actually have a quick conversion installed into our aircraft from passenger to cargo. And uh, that's why we wanted to have them on board uh, from, from the beginning. Yeah. Very, very fascinating, Freshta. Uh, what about, what are we going to see first? Will we see a sky truck first or a sky bus first? Cargo first or passenger? Yeah, probably... Um, I, ideally both, but uh, probably the the sky truck first, and we're also thinking about actually having uh, the sky truck autonomous. So um, that's why, like in remote areas like the sky truck, that's what probably will be actually proving uh, the whole concept first. It's going to be easier also for certification. But the sky bus is definitely um, uh, also going to be like simultaneously pushed forward. <laughs> For Skybus, the passenger version, will you be working hand in hand and integrating with existing trains or buses? We've seen airlines, you know, Star Lines or Lufthansa has a Deutsche Bahn alliance, for example, or even in the US, there's the landline bus service that uh, does code sharing with a few airlines. Are you foreseeing yourself working with the likes of Landline or even Greyhound for that matter? Definitely, battery? definitely. And that's where I'm saying like the, this is where where we cannot basically get into the, the smaller niches or the smaller uh, uh, areas. Yes, definitely we, we, we can. It's just like with the air taxis, um, whatever they can basically take over for our last mile or for, for certain areas where we cannot access, definitely. Yeah, I'm very curious now how, how they see they will see this as business being added to 
their own network as opposed to business being taken away uh, reminds me of how when uber started entering european markets and how taxi drivers first felt threatened but now you can book normal taxis like in berlin uh, on on uh, using uber and uh, you normally a little taxi will show up which is very very no, interesting good point Shashank. Um, sorry uh, to interrupt you but um this is a good point and that's why we're um going there also step by step and we see the resonance we see the interest we see like okay um there's a lot of um customers that do understand what we're offering and thank god we're not if we came like 10 years ago it would have been much much harder for us so thank god that the air taxis have actually disrupted the market the last 10 years people know what an air taxi is so our job is not right. that hard but um still like now upscaling it the um people uh, customers are open for it and partners are open for it they're listening to it and they're actually uh engaging with us very uh actively um but yes uh, i think the these details like <laughs> some of the uh mindset hurdles I, they need to be uh approached very sensitively like really like from different angles to understand them because I do understand them as well, but I know once they actually see, that's why we're doing so many pilot projects because it's, it's leading by example. So if we actually show that it's working, that's when people actually are coming to us um, as well on their own. So, yeah. What about um, perception? I mean, you are talking about acceptability that people are now familiar with EV tolls, but what about, you know, a 40 seater, right? You, you probably can fly longer from EV toll heads. I've heard about this, um, this radius of two hours that they typically cannot reach because you need to use the lavatory and traditional EV tolls don't have labs. So will yours have a lab? Are you questioning the traditional assumptions? How are you dealing with this mindset? Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> that's an interesting question. Uh, yes, we were discussing all these as well. I mean, we have um, the 40 seater, the idea with the 40 seater, of course, is like to um, make it as simple as possible not even space for your luggage basically like it's really it should be like literally a bus in the sky like would you take your luggage with a bus on the ground no you wouldn't would you use the toilet on the bus on the ground no you wouldn't so we're trying to see like if that's basically um also the what our customers are needing right now uh also in the next five years and ten years and also the routes that we're covering so it's all the metrics that we're looking at but um Yes, but then we have the business um, 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 version, the, the corporate version, so which has the 19 seats. So of course, there we have everything else uh, in it. So that's and and we we need to um, th these questions. Uh, we're still working on on these details, uh, especially that our customers are now um, having we're having different kind of customers as well. So <laughs> different clusters and different characteristics and different goals. So. We're we're seeing what what is more beneficial now for um, all of us, also in the first. Yeah, it's going to be such a fascinating journey because yes, you may get the regulators, yes, you may get the initial pilots, but just because you have built it doesn't mean they will come. So you have to win the passengers' hearts and then of course their wallets as well. Uh, speaking of wallets, how is your funding situation and plans? Um, I believe you're looking for an entry into service in 2030, which is ambitious, I would say. How much capital have you raised? What more do you need? Can we help in any way? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, it is. Uh, first of all, yeah, it is uh, ambitious. The the um, uh, but why we're so confident that um, of course we it's subject to funding also also along the the journey, but um, I, we believe that five to six years is quite realistic if we look at it that we're using a lot of existing technology, and um, so that's when we're actually not reinventing the wheel so it's not rocket science for us so uh, the team and uh, i were, we looked at it and uh, even like uh, from regulator side so we have some advisors there having a look at this uh from different uh views it is ambitious but it's uh realistic we would say um and yeah, funding. We have raised uh, our first rounds, but uh, of course, on this journey, we will <laughs> um, need a few more investors along the way uh, to actually get where we want to uh, get and also to accelerate maybe even our journey. So um, yeah, definitely there is still some. Are you able to share how much you have raised and what you will need before your entry into service in 2030? Well, I can share with you how much uh, we will need. So yeah, definitely. <laughs> Well, uh, uh, probably uh, getting even till, uh, to, to, to certification and zero production uh, around a billion. Uh, 
around 1 billion euros. And that's just uh, the sky bus. And if we look at the air taxis, they're already like one and a half billion, which is realistic. So even if we're at one and a half billion, that's realistic as well. So one to one, one and a half. Um, but that's the thing, like the, the aircrafts that we're selling is each of them cost like 40 million. So there's a double digit billion, um, uh, revenue coming back in. So <laughs> that's uh, basically the, the math that we're having. Right, right, exactly. Well, this this needs to go mainstream for exactly. this to pay off for the yeah, investors definitely. as well. And have you all, I'm, I'm guessing you have raised seed, are you looking to raise Series A and Series B after yeah. this then? Uh, we, yes, yes. So the, the next steps are right now we're also in talks with the investors, yes. <laughs> okay, well, good luck with that <laughs> as well. Um, it's it's so interesting. And again, I'm, I'm so curious how this turns out. Um, you also have recently announced a 19-seater aircraft for business aviation called a turbobus. What is this? It seems like you're doing everything. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, what we're doing is, yes, we have expanded our portfolio, true. Uh, last year, we were focusing only on the mass transit, so the 40-passenger, and then this guy truck, the cargo. And this year, we noticed after the conversations with some um, uh business jetliners from Brazil and the US that there is a big, big market for the business um, aviation, uh, especially the 19 seats. So because if you say, let's say each seat would cost in this case, like 2 million for high net worth uh, individuals, that's nothing. Uh, if you can actually have the luxury to take off right in front of your doorstep and you don't have to actually drive to the runway, to the airport, to the runway, etc. So you have the luxury to take off with your whole family or your whole um, corporate uh, team right at the doorstep. So, of course, that's where we're hitting actually nerve there. And then, uh, so we expanded our portfolio there. It's the same aircraft, but it's uh, just take out the seats. It's like a plug and play a bit. <laughs> so you're taking out the seats. You have the 19 seats and then you have the luxurious version. And uh, then we have... The, uh, for humanitarian causes, yes, we have the turbo bus, basically. That's where we, um, actually upgraded the, the, the tank constellation and, uh, the design of, uh, that to increase the range up to 2000 kilometers. And, um, for, let's say, like, uh, the, the tsunamis that you have in Japan, for example, from, uh, Tokyo to Wakanai, you have a one and a half thousand kilometers, uh, of range, um, that we can then cover. Uh, so point to point where we're independent of any runways and we can evacuate faster. We can just be there faster. We don't even have to cover the 2000, but even in those cases, we, we can just really evacuate faster, drop them off, pick them up quickly and just, um, be, be there. And, uh, why we're looking into the humanitarian causes as well is, um, also in Geneva at eBase, we, we, we announced it is, um, because we see that, uh, by 2030, at least like um the 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 numbers of natural disasters worldwide will increase also largely due to climate change uh which yes you also know um i know when it comes also sustainability we need to do something where whether it's like um also on technology side of it like to 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 create more sustainable solutions but also to help out while actually the house is burning sometimes how what solutions do we have for example, Hawaii, the, the wildfires you have, uh, if we had our sky buses there, <clears throat> we would definitely be able to actually quickly deliver help out like uh, from island to island, actually um, point to point. And that's where we come in, basically. So that's where we see a big uh, uh, pain point there. And that's why we expand it. Again, it's the same aircraft, but uh, more flexible, basically, when it comes to um, humanitarian causes and with a larger range than, yeah. Right, right. Um, you're sounding like Airbus to me. You know, we've got the A320, we've got the A319, we've got the A318, we've got the A220, we've got the A380. What do you want to buy? But I'm, I don't mean this as, I, I do mean this as a compliment because it seems like you're one of those few startups who's trying to not run around with a, with a hammer in search of a nail. You're saying, here is our kitty of products and we can customize the solution to your needs. So you are, you know, it's more like horses for courses, right? So it's, it's a very, very interesting approach. I'm, I do not know of startup companies uh, building aircraft with a portfolio 
uh, approach. So that's very unique. Maybe that's the German in you and the fact that you're based in Hamburg, that this is coming I'm getting through. the air of Airbus, I guess, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, finally, you know, if you look 10 to 15 years ahead from now, let's say you secure your 1 to 1.5 billion in funding, your Sky buses are shuttling Microsoft employees, your Sky trucks are taking uh, medicine and cargo into important places and hard to reach places. What is your 10 to 15 year vision? What does success look like to you, Freshta? Well, for, to me, it would, uh, it's, it's uh, I guess, um, for me, it's, it's very clear. This this is an aircraft that I um, uh, want to see, or I will see um, uh, actually writing a legacy, which means that it's a new kind of aircraft that is flying all over the world. Like in, um, in ma- many places, we have like a, a target of 2,000 um, pre-orders already within the next two years, for example. So I know there there is a, a huge uh, um, area that we can cover on new routes. I, I see it. Okay, maybe the vision that I have, a bit more crazier language, I see like the brain neurons. <laughs> so we can actually, we are in the position now with a sky bus and a sky track to create new routes. So for me, those are new neurons on our planet. So we're creating all that and actually, yes, um, achieving that on the entire planet. And, 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 uh, that is something that I'm looking forward to. And then adding to, to sustainability, actually actively, yes, through the fuels that we use, but also through the technology that we use, uh, with the engines that we use, uh, the electric engines, but also, uh, in the long run, if we look in, uh, let's say 20 to 30 years, if our sky bus actually becomes the new normal, instead of like a bus, uh, you take the, the sky shuttle and it's actually then a hundred percent hydrogen fuel. Um, uh, so this is like a dream, like, and then you actually can avoid, uh, deforestation in certain parts. Wow. Okay. This is exactly that, that, that kind of vision that I have with our sky bus. <laughs> I love it. And finally, why do you think you are the right person or the team you're putting together is the right team to bring this vision to reality? Uh, Because I think it takes the mental uh, courage, the confidence to know that what I believe in will manifest. And uh, I guess I, I see that it has worked the last four or five years. So even not being an engineer, not even having the background in aviation and not even knowing any uh, uh, aerospace engineers, suddenly all the puzzle pieces came together. So which means that it's my confidence because I know it's the right way to go. And then they're getting the resonance from the market, from our customers, from the partners. We're right now like working on 19 different projects worldwide. So this is something like I'm, I know this is, uh, just the beginning of the journey. So that's what makes me uh, the, the, I guess, the, the perfect fit for this uh, role to, to lead this company. And, uh, but yeah, also my team, it's, it's, uh, th- this is the right team because they are believers. I think if you have believers on board, um, that's when you have actually gold in your hand. And um, that's why I'm, I'm happy also like to, expand that team in the future and uh, have more believers. <laughs> Presta, I do wish you all the best. This is quite exciting. And I'm, I've known you for some time and you were featured as a startup to watch in my first book with Dirk Singer, uh, Sustainability in the Air. And it's exciting to be finally speaking to have you on the podcast. Thanks. Now, the final part of this interview is called called the rapid fire round in which we get to know you a bit more personally and we ask you simple questions like what's your favorite airline my uh, yeah uh, my favorite airline is the emirates because they um well because of the great service actually they 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 feel the passengers so it's uh, i like that <laughs> well you you know how angry you made yeah. me <laughs> 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 okay. okay favorite airport uh, the Fairport Airport is, uh, well, uh, the LAX. Actually, every time I was like, getting off there, it was like completely, uh, yeah, I was in my zone. I was in my world. It was just uh, the, the, the smell of it, the, 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 the vibe of it, I guess. It's just, yeah. <laughs> okay. Wow. Uh, LAX uh, seldom makes it to this podcast, <laughs> but here we are. Okay. <laughs> All right. 
Um, LAX, what's your favorite book? Uh, the Subtle Art of Giving a Fuck by Mark Manson. Okay, okay. Have you read his other book, which is Will Smith's yeah. uh, oh, biography? That, really? Oh, you should read it. Will Smith's biography. It's not an autobiography, it's a biography. Okay. So you should read it. Oh, nice, it's nice, a good nice. Good, good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How about your favorite movie? Uh, one of them, I mean, I have a lot of them, but uh, one of them is The Aviator with Lenny, Leonardo DiCaprio. So that's, that's a crazy mm-hmm. movie. <laughs> okay, okay. That's a good one. Inspiring indeed. Uh, what do you do in your free time, Presto? Well, you will probably laugh, but I hug trees. <laughs> you hug trees. You're a tree. You're a f- physically you hug trees. Yes, but I step behind it. Do you believe you can? <laughs> do you believe you can speak? No, to them? I think I just uh, I, I I can hug them and I can feel their hugs and the, I don't know. It's just like some power that I get from them. <laughs> have you have you tried hugging humans oh, yes. as well? <laughs> They're pretty good too. <laughs> that also works yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right what is something you would like to learn um on my list is uh actually diving deep sea diving i tried that once okay. on bali but then i had an accident so i still i'm <laughs> i'm not giving up so i'm gonna repeat that yeah <laughs> okay okay all right um, and finally, what's the best advice you've received, Freshta? Oh, I think the best advice that has actually even changed my my entire life is um, there are no failures. It's all an experiment. So that took off like a lot of burden off my shoulders. So that helped me. Yeah. Wow. There, there are no failures. Yeah. It's, all, it's all experiments. It's all experiments. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, on that high note, why don't we call it a day Presha thank you very much for your insights it's very exciting work that you're doing and thank I do wish so you all much, the best thank you. I really appreciate this beautiful questions and a beautiful interview thank you I really appreciate it thank you for listening to this episode of sustainability in the air aviation is one of the hardest to decarbonize industries yet there are multiple paths to get to net zero awareness is key to a green future So please give us your support to help our sustainable aviation insights reach a wider audience. You can do this by sharing this episode on your network, on LinkedIn, Twitter, or even WhatsApp. Or perhaps you might consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to this episode. You can start a conversation with us by writing to us at podcast at simplifying that's simply with an i dot com and for more content on sustainable aviation please visit our website green dot simplifying dot com and join the movement sustainability in the air is an original podcast by simplifying the show is produced by Juraj Toth in Slovakia Dirk Singer is our director of sustainability who leads research for each interviewee out of Greenwich, UK. Shubhadeep Pal is our supervising editor based out of Mumbai and Singapore. The articles are written by Ayushi Badola in Dehradun in India and Meera Hull in Montreal, Quebec. Creative design is led by Lihia Esteve in Montreal. Baiba Dreamen is the project director for the show based out of Valencia, Spain. Special thanks to Wendy Sim in Singapore. And I'm Shashank Nigam, the CEO of Simplifying and your host. Please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn.